This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects is the free app that lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download Bloomberg Connects to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their influences and their cultural experiences, the books they read, the music they listen to, the art and artists that have fascinated them. And this episode, I'm delighted to say, is A Brush With Ronnie Horn. Born in New York in 1955, Ronnie studied at the Rhode Island School of Design and then at Yale University. And from the start, her work has been extraordinarily diverse. She's probably best known for her work in sculpture, but she's made work in drawing, in photography, in installation and in artist books, among other things. Now, her subjects are similarly diverse, but there are certain preoccupations that consistently weave their way through her work in all its different forms. And one of those consistent qualities is a sense of flux. The form and the meaning of her work is mutable, and our role as the viewer in interpreting the work and experiencing it is vital. So, for instance, if you take her cast glass sculptures, these rather beautiful, quiet and seductive pieces which are in a single colour, they're often big square or cylindrical blocks which are displayed in lots of space, often on their own. Outside, they're frosted and rather deliciously opaque, but on the top surface, they're polished. And sometimes when you approach them, that flat surface, that glass surface is self-evident, but more often than not, they take on the quality of water. And so this very solid sculpture suddenly becomes a kind of liquid and uncertain object and of course the key thing about that is the reflections that they take on so that's dependent upon all sorts of conditions like the light in the space and the architecture around it and of course our movement as the viewer when we approach it and walk around it. In this sense, Ronnie's work has a lot in common with minimalism in that the work and the space around it are to be seen as one indivisible thing. But Ronnie's actually described her work as a critique of minimalism. And one of the key ways that her work diverges from minimalism is that minimalism, of course, denies symbolic or metaphorical readings. But Ronnie's work actually often has maximal content. And many of the works, as we'll hear, refer directly to literature, for instance. But also Ronnie's long established a connection between her work and her identity and talked about the connection between between her androgynous persona with that of her work. Androgyny, she said, is the possibility of the thing containing multiple identities. Integrating difference is the basis of identity, not the exclusion of it. The most powerful manifestation of this idea of shifting identities within a single person is in her photo pieces. In You Are the Weather, which is a piece that she made in 1994 to 95, there are a hundred photographs of the same woman, a woman called Margaret, who was pictured by Ronnie in various outdoor pools in Iceland, those hot springs that appear dotted across that extraordinary country. They each feature close-ups of Margaret's face and they're shot by Ronnie in different weather conditions, amid storms or in sunlight, and as Ronnie said, depending upon the light or the wind when the photographs were taken, Margaret adopted different personalities. Now, not only do the photographs change, but the ways in which that work is presented change. So in one form, it was an artist's book, but it's also been shown in a gallery as an installation with the hundred photographs around you in the space. And of course, one's experience of that works very different if you're flicking through a book and going from page to page than when you're surrounded by these images and there's this odd game of scrutiny going on. You're looking at Margaret and she's staring at you in a hundred manifestations in the room. Now, it's crucial that You Are The Weather was made in Iceland because since she first visited that country in 1975, it's played a huge role in Ronnie's life and artistic imagination. Among the many other projects it's prompted is an ongoing series of artist books called To Place, which Ronnie has said grows less complete with each volume, even though it is now 10 volumes strong. And indeed, the reason she's come on this podcast is because she's just published Island Zombie, Iceland Writings, a collection of texts and text-based artworks which have been inspired by her experiences in Iceland. And it's a wonderful, beguiling read in which Ronnie takes us deep into her experience of Iceland, camping in its wild landscapes, motorcycling across its rough terrain, bathing in those hot pools, lying on a beach only to find a seabird landing on her stomach, and amazingly, living for six weeks in a lighthouse. And then there are the references that punctuate her experiences, the artists and authors who haunt her imagination as she travels within the island. So Emily Dickinson, the poet, who we'll hear a lot about a bit later, and people like Edgar Allan Poe and Wallace Stevens. 
So I began our conversation by asking Ronnie about something that she writes in the book. I'm often asked, she says, but I have no idea why I chose Iceland, why I first started going, why I still go. In truth, I believe Iceland chose me. What, I asked, did she mean by that? Once I uh, identified it as something of interest, which I think from reading the book, you know that I have this hypothesis of when that occurred back in 1963. I think, um, plus my relationship to, to islands and solitude, it was a shoe in for me. So when I arrived, uh, I felt, well, I certainly recognized it, but I felt like it was such a generous place in terms of what I was receiving. So I, I took it personally, like I do with most uh, pleasurable experiences. Uh, and, I, and I would say in that sense, it, it chose me because, you know, it's very hard to get friends to come over there it was because it's so austere in every way, which is something that I actually very much love. That the landscape people regard as being inhospitable and I think for most people it is, it's very windy, it's very rainy, uh, but I, everything about Iceland made sense to me in a way that few things do. And I think that's how I, there was a reciprocity right from the beginning, if you can have that within sentient things. But I think, I think you can, I, I really, I feel that, you know, in, in my lifestyle and everything. One of the things that really comes across in the book is about that, in a way, the blurring of sentience, in the sense that Iceland is like a body. Oh, yeah. So often, as you're describing it, it's like a body. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I, I loved uh, uh, Jeanette Winterson's blurb on the back of the book. I don't know if you picked up on that. I just thought, wow, she really nailed me to the wall on that. Because it, it was always, I, there was an erotic element to it, uh, very much so. Very, very much so. I look at it now, and I think, geez, no wonder why I was hanging out there all the time. You know, uh, it, 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 not just simple sensuality. I mean something more complex than that, more uh, reaching all of my, my, my spiritual and my physical well-being, you know. You know, Iceland, the, the, there's, there's a very common story told about Iceland because one of the great things about it, or it's not as much true today, but it was true, that they had a lot of churches but not a lot of religion. What they had was awe. They had a lot of awe because the, the, the landscape is awesome. And not just um, in a monumental way so much. It's more to do with you're often in situations you really aren't clear whether this is a man-made folly or a practical joke or, in fact, a purposeful architectural element and in fact, it's all organic, it, it, you know, and, and that was such so striking to me. So it is, Iceland, its geology often exists in this ambiguous place. That's one thing. Another thing is that, you know, and what was very important for me in terms of my developing relationship with Iceland was the fact that I had nothing to be afraid of, really, unless I was an idiot, you know, in, in, in a weather sense. Because you have to be, I think the weather is what <laughs> can kill you there. Uh, and in other words, you're not going to get eaten by a polar bear or murdered by a nut job, you know, kind of thing, right? And as a woman, that especially becomes an issue if you're going to be out in a tent. I mean, it sounds like uh, it's not something because of my androgyny. I so Growing up, I never felt like, oh, I have to take a cab after 10 o'clock at night. In New York City, I never had any trouble. Uh, on the other hand, my girlfriends were always laboring under that reality. So it's a mix of things there. Um, but being out in the landscape in Iceland, it's really just a, a, a matter of um, tuning into it. And without any shadows, psychological shadows, uh, preventing me from being there and having this attention, this, this transparent interaction with the place. And the idea for years, every time I would go, it would all be new to me. You know, and, and you, you think about the first time you experience something, that's like 
that's unique. You know, you never have it again. I was growing all the time in the relationship with ice. I was learning, you know, things all the time. Uh, and uh, I, I just, it kept me very busy. That sense of a constantly renewing experience is one of the things I experience when I'm looking at your work. And I wonder how much that is something that has come into your work from Iceland or was a sort of, was something that you had in your, your sensibility and you found it in Iceland, if you know what I mean. In a way, what came first or is that indeed a constantly moving idea? Well, I think that, you you know, like you have, the, there's a text in uh, Island Zombie, Mirror Island, Mirror, and I think it's very much that. I mean, I, uh, for better or worse, have a tendency to be quite self-conscious, uh, the way I was brought up. Spending so much time alone in Iceland, that self-consciousness led to a kind of hyper-awareness of things. And of course, you, you don't know whether you're projecting or you're reflecting, you know, uh, whether, or, or whether the landscape is reflecting you or just being what it is, you know. So, so there was this consciousness, particularly in the desert, because the desert is a fascinating uh, setting for me because it doesn't, it's not especially generous, and there's so little visually, relatively visually there. And of course, in Iceland, the deserts are all ice and ash, but it's the same as I can imagine. It's similar to a, 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 a hot desert. A, a dozen nothing there has the scale of a Sahara, and I, I think scale alone can be its own form of desert. Uh, the idea that you, you don't get to the end is a form of desert, you know. I wanted to, you, you mentioned about androgyny earlier on, and I was struck by something that you said in a way which relates to what we were just talking about, this sort of um, constantly shifting quality in your work. You talked about the A-sphere series, mm. this kind of mm. um, these apparently abstract shapes mm. Mm. Um, and how you related them to your androgyny and, and saw them almost as self-portraits. Absolutely. Could you, could you tell me? Could you tell me more about that? Yeah, I, I, I uh, a friend of mine, their first experience, you know, with the A sphere, uh, at a show, and when the show came down, uh, she said to me, "Well, you know, Ronnie, um, uh, it the A sphere is something that becomes less familiar the more time I spend with it." Uh, I was so happy about that paradox. It seemed. It seemed to go to the core of uh, many, many things that I'm questioning or looking at in my work. One of which is, um, it's true, 90% of the audience believes it's a ball. And they call it a sphere, two words, right? They're constantly, even Google corrects me. <laughs> but the reality is, it, it is a term that's used in, in optics, uh, an aspherical lens, meaning uh, not symmetrical. <clears throat> in one axis. Anyway, but the idea of androgyny f uh, was always, it's always been part of my life uh, from as early as I can remember. Uh, I think a lot to do with my name, but I think it's more than that. I think I was, I was you know, born this way. Like, uh, my, my gender is none of your fucking business. And, and I've always felt that, always felt that, you know. And I never played that card. And, you know, you, you pay for it pretty heavily, or you did back then, in terms of people's attitudes and ability to accept a non-gendered a non presentation, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. It was, uh, it was difficult for me. Uh, people were not uh, comfortable with it. I think now it, it's irrelevant, almost irrelevant, at least in New York City. I, I hear that we live in a bubble, and... <laughs> I'm terrified of my neighbors at this point with the 70 million people who voted for Trump. You really think, okay, <laughs> you don't want any neighbors now. But, you know, that, that idea of androgyny where you're really involved in integrating the differences and integrating the possibilities and not as you do when you claim a heterosexual or a homosexual or a male or a female. That's excluding everything else but that one thing, and I've ne and, and I th I've had a natural relationship to taking the best of every world, you know, whether it's gender or or um, even in religion. I'd have to say that you know, as a uh, growing up as a secular Jew, 
But I, I, theology was always very interesting to me. I even thought when I was at Yale, I, you know, I kind of played with the idea just to go down that road because the issues fascinated me. But I wasn't really especially interested in any one religion. I was happy to find things wherever um, my readings took me, what, whether you know, it was into Buddhism or e even the early uh, Hasidic uh, mysticism. So I, I'm no expert in any of that, but I always found those issues fascinating. And I think they, to some extent, they're reflected in my work. I myself am not a religious person in any way, and um, I'm kind of horrified at the way it's being, been used in my lifetime um, as another form of exclusion. So um, let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests now. Um, who was the first artist whose work you loved? You know, my parents used to take me to the Met a lot, and I, I loved going up those steps. And I had no critical facility. We're talking about like an eight-year-old kid. But I was taking it all in. So there's that level of wow. But when I became sort of early teens, I'd say, 12, 13, 14. I, you know, this is kind of a, he's a popular boy, but I really felt a strong affinity to um, uh, Marcel Duchamp. I, uh, you know, for the obvious reason of the conceptual, what I consider to be a conceptual framework uh, in, the, in the way he approached uh, what was a meaningful experience to offer. You know, the analytical side as well obviously, but I also think, I, I, I don't know that I would say that my experience of his work is like, oh my God, the pinnacle of, no, it was more this model of this possibility of an artist exploring exactly what they wanted to do, regardless of, well, is it visual? Uh, is it sculpture or is it painting? You know, none of that crap mattered. You know, and I and I that made sense to me because I mean I decided to major in sculpture because it wasn't medium specific. I figured as all it had to be was three dimensional, and that's pretty. You know, you can negotiate a sheet of paper on that. You know what I mean? So I didn't. I felt that was the place for me, but so I don't have that relationship to sculpture particularly. It's not the form that gets me. Uh, especially uh, uh, more than any others. It's just, I took it that way as a, as a freedom. Like uh, painting at Yale, you had a oil on canvas, acrylic, you know, it was a specific thing. And who's to say where the influence comes from? But I was reading his, his writings. Uh, he had a number of books of drawings that were published on a very limited basis that I found and which I lent to one of my teachers and uh, he uh, did not return them. And they were erotic drawings, you know, so I wonder why. But uh, I also enjoyed his, um, his androgyny and his wonderful freedom with regard to gender and, and all of that. I, I, I think uh, all of that just kind of locked into my, my idea of my, uh, you know, what, could, what could be. On the other hand, you know, I, I, I could stand in front of an Ang painting or a Vermeer for, yeah, I mean, serious, th that stuff was also. So I, I'm in the full, full range of really, really uh, moving experiences when I was a kid. So, but it was all discovery. Yeah. You know? Um, which historical t artist do you turn to the most today? Do you, when you look back at art history, which which historical artist do you turn to? You know, I, I, I you know, again, I can't, I can't go there. I, 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 I turn to so many. You know, okay, I love Dirge drawings, Ang's drawings, Ang's paintings, um, Masaccio, uh, uh, Fra Angelica. Like he, I, I look at him like he's the op-ed page of the New York Times. You know, it's just like. <laughs> The level of violence and, and, you know, and also the pastoral is a very amazing combination of all the energies of the world of that time and the way they're represented. They're, they're uh, really uh, uh, quite riveting. And, you know, then you can look at somebody like a John Cage who had this wonderful sense of humor 
And for me, humor is essential to any form, uh, and nothing can be meaningful to me without it. I figured that out. Not people, not art, nothing. Uh, and that's partly, I think, my culture. But, um, I, for example, I can't work with somebody who doesn't have a sense of humor. I, 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 it's like a dancer. I'm always, uh, I, I wind up off, uh, up a tree or, or out of sync, you know, if, if I can't get that. <laughs> um, let's talk about living artists. Which living artists do you most admire? Would you say, would there be like a recently deceased artist? or? Well, I was going to come to... 100% you... <laughs> living. <laughs> Well, this is, is that, okay, let, let, look, I, I don't know if you were referring to the person that I think you may be referring to, but I'd like to talk about Felix Gonzalez Torres because he seems very present still because his influence is so widespread. But also you and he had this extraordinary relationship, uh, mm-hmm. sadly towards the end of his life because he's no longer with us. He died 24 years ago. Is that but, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but um, you and he had an extraordinary productive friendship in terms of artwork. So can you tell us about Felix and about that exchange? Because it really is an extraordinary moment, I think. You know, the first time I met Felix, he talked a lot about his boyfriend, Ross. And I had never met him. And uh, I'm trying to remember if he was still alive or he had just passed away. But what Felix would do is he would triangulate me with Ross and himself. I was always the third person in a, in a, in, present in his relationship to Ross whenever we spoke. And this was because he and Ross had spent time at, at MoCA when I did my show in 1990. Back. Uh, and I think really for the first time I showed the gold, gold field, which I had actually done in 1980. 82 it was made but I I didn't have the right venue to show it so I just didn't but so I pulled this thing out and Ross and Felix fell in love with that uh, uh, as Felix has shared with me on many occasions it became a kind of a touchstone for him as he's communicated to me and Felix being Felix is a, a very very special persona and I was very uh didn't take any talking really to have a communal feeling between us and we we just shared a lot of the language obviously expressed very differently but the language was very very close organically close like also with Douglas Gordon his early work, there's a, I have a lot of shared connections with Douglas, um, who is also an artist, particularly his films and film installations, Play Dead, Psycho, all of them. Uh, absolutely essential, I think. Um, I agree, yeah. And then things just kind of went back and forth. Then I think I'm trying to remember because I feel like I can make up a story, but I'm trying to really be true <laughs> to what, what actually happened. At some point... Felix, uh, he was he was ill when I met him, and but he was he was in good shape, and then it kind of started to move in a direction. And um, he called me one evening, and he would talk to me about he was wanted to talk about his um, memorial, actually, and you know he asked me if I would speak at his memorial, which I mean I'd never been asked something like that by somebody in his position. And then when I realized, when we hung up, I understood that he decided that he wasn't going to do chemotherapy. So I guess his doctors had said, okay, now either you're going to do it or it's going to go this way, or you're not going to do it and it's going to go this way. And that I have, this is what I put together in the aftermath of that conversation. But it inspired this idea of um, the paired mats for the boys and, you know, it was a shoe in for me because the pairing was already so big a part of my language. But I love that light in between. I just thought that is perfect for Felix, you know. So, so basically, should we describe it? So you've got, you've got two sheets of gold. Right. And it's quite miraculous in the gallery space, isn't it? Because you have the two sheets of gold and then between them, there is this space that opens up with this extraordinary light and this and this, and this incredible space and it does feel like like almost like an apparition totally uh, yeah emerging. yeah well the gold thing was it's just the light going in there and reflecting off itself uh of course people think it's there's a light bulb in there 
but I've never dealt in illusion of any kind. It, it, everything you can see in my work, it's there uh, through its own forces. So, the, the, but when I saw the light, for the first time I did the gold field, the single field, and I started to play with it in the studio, and I saw this, this light, which when I look back on it, I didn't, I, I was coming at it more philosophically. For me, it was like this surface that had no substance. It just was this, it's, it's thinner than your hair, a hair on your head kind of thing, but it had this object integrity, and I was into all that. Then, of course, when I started folding it, it became about the whole questioning, the whole history and the mythology of gold. You know, like there was never any splendor in my experience of gold before that. You know, it was always like, OK, uh, um, jewelry is compromised by being alloyed. And all this technical stuff. And it was just yellow. It was never about splendor. But when you go back into the religious and uh, uh, mythological um, commentary, gold figures very heavily as a kind of idea of perfection, of sun, of immortality, of all these really exceptional things that I, could, I never understood it until, I, until I did that piece. And that piece gave me a peace of mind for a period of time, just feeling like, oh, I've seen something I never saw before, as you know, back in the early 80s. But so bringing that to Felix was a real, I was very happy with that, um, that I found that opportunity. And of course, Felix made a work in response to Goldfield, which was called Untitled Placebo Landscape for Ronnie. So, that, I mean, it, the effect on him, you know, the, the text still exists. And I really urge people listening to this to go online and find Felix's text about Ronnie's work, because it is extraordinary. It's an amazing, I mean, I, I can't imagine what it must have been like for you to read that, because it is, you know, he's, he's, utterly depressed about what's happening yeah. in the United States yeah, in yeah. that period. It's like a jackhammer. I thought oh, when he gave me that title, this is like a jackhammer. It's fantastic, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. You know, there's this, that it, it is a dialogue. It's a dialogue through art. You're, yes, yes, you're, there's a friendship, but it's a dialogue through art as well, which, you know, it seems to me is tremendously profound now and will live on long, you know, when we're all gone. It, that dialogue's there in the form of art. I, you know, there are certain artists you meet that you just think uh, they, they raise the level of uh, and potential for human experience in a way that is irreversible. Okay. He, he is definitely one of them. The other person I was thinking of when we were talking about recently deceased was uh, Mike Kelly. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of his, especially his abject, his adventure into abjection. And uh, I love his, his drawings and many aspects of his work, many, many aspects, the playfulness, the anger, all of it. Uh, and I think as a taking as a whole, it's quite an extraordinary range in his work. Let's talk about museums and galleries. Uh, which, which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? You're not going to like this answer. <laughs> For a long time, when I was growing up, the thing I loved to go see was the Museum of American Indians, the Hay Foundation up in the Bronx. And that was an amazing collection of artifacts produced by uh, Native Americans. Uh, and then they fucked it up. They sent it down to Bowling Green and I stopped going. But... The other one is the Museum of Natural History is probably my favorite museum in the city just because I love all that, you know, whether it's the rocks or the dioramas or, and, and I've spent a lot of time up there. Then I'd go, you know, to, uh, is it my favorite? I don't know. But I often would go to the Frick when I first came to New York because I could sit in that room with the fountain and read all day. And nobody bothered me. And I had this horrible apartment, so that was perfect. I kind of use it as my studio because I do that. Um, I could make a coffee shop into my studio, you know, and when I'm trapped, whatever. I'm very, very, uh, I improvise all the way. Um, and, of course, all of the amazing paintings there. But then I could just as easily go to MoMA because uh, MoMA is just uh, certainly, having grown up with access to it, which is one image of MoMA, it's more contained and 
was very important to my education. Now it's a more complicated relationship. Uh, I have a lot more questions about the way it's uh, developed and what it's become. And I'm not as connected to it, quite frankly, which is, I don't think it, it, I don't know that it has anything to do with MoMA. I think it's kind of a way of the world. Um, you know, and you can't, I remember being up at the Met, which I also love, and I was in this show, uh, it was a show of paintings of some artist, that uh, old uh, master, and I was just taking too much time, and the guards would come over and say, you know, you, you got to move on. And I was, that was it. I, I mean, that was, and that was, you're talking late 70s, you know, and I was shocked by it. It was just, that's not acceptable, you know. So anyway... Um, and of course, now I don't like being in a room with a with hundred other people trying to see the same thing. So now it becomes an issue of who do I know at that place? Can I get in before the museum opens kind of thing? And, and then I do. And usually, but usually that's for specific shows, not so much to see the collection, you know. Um, you know, then when um, in New York, that's, that, those would be like, of course, I like the Whitney because I think they have always kind of been an off-brand kind of, they've always shown the artists that are off-brand, which is meaning like maybe not the same market as, as the artists at MoMA, but no less important to me, you know. So one of the most, uh, a show that I saw at, at the Whitney when I was, I think I was in undergraduate, I think it was early 70s. Robert Irwin did a show at the Whitney and I walked up onto that fourth floor room and there was fucking nothing in it. It was just like empty. And you know, I didn't really know his work. I was just checking it. And I was walking across the room and this little thing brushed my forehead. This, And of course that was the scrim. And that was quite a wonderful experience. You know, that not just that it was, that this artist has this, uh, um, idea, but that the museum understood it. That, that was just an amazing commitment, you know, of, I don't know, what is that, like 7,000 square feet of empty? Really a beautiful experience because it really made everything about the experience in that moment more acute, you know, and that's it. It's like Agnes Martin, you know, you look at an artist like that and you think, oh, uh, it's like Pollock and Agnes Martin and people say, oh, I could do that. <laughs> you know, that routine, I always laugh at that because it's such an irrelevant fact. But Agnes Martin, I just think she was a very courageous person. She was kind of fearless. You think, okay, really? You think that graphite line can have Meaning, to have that faith and also the fact that she proved her point very well, I think, in terms of, you know, I'm still going back to those drawings. They're, they're eternally, utterly compelling, aren't they? It's extraordinary how they retain that. Yeah, and they're not facile and they're not complicated in any obvious way. And I love that. I love things that aren't facile. I'm more suspicious of facile Unless you're dead, like, and then I can say, okay, well, he was facile, but, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it, contemporary art is very facile. It, it's a different kind of uh, willing suspension of disbelief that I have to bring to it. It's almost like you get a handicap for be, being facile from me. You have to really work hard to prove it to me. Because, you know, my whole practice is based on the fact that I'm not facile. So, you know, whether it's the drawings... Anything, you know, none of it is, is, I don't have any skill sets, to be honest. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. The app offers access to numerous cultural institutions through a single download. Now, as Ronnie says, she used to go to the Frick Collection to read amid the peace and quiet there, and you can take a virtual tour of the Frick spaces, including that grand yet tranquil garden court that Ronnie talks about on the Bloomberg Connects app, as well as exploring the collection's many masterpieces. 
Another museum on the app that's renowned for its old masters is Dulwich Picture Gallery. Among the many great works in Dulwich's collection is Poussin's Triumph of David, and you can hear a great description of this along with many other highlights while you zoom in to the picture. And what a painting that Poussin is. It's unusual in that it captures the moment that David brings Goliath's head into Jerusalem to great fanfare. So, as well as the gruesome, cadaverous head of the giant on a stick, Poussin focuses with his customary, immaculate sense of harmony on the variety of responses and activities among the crowds around David and Goliath. The happy, oblivious children, the women scattering flowers, the expressive trumpeters. For more content and to explore guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at app.bloombergconnects.org slash a brush with. You, you mentioned there that you were going to the frick and reading. So let's talk about literature and I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> um, which books and writers do you return to? Well, the one that, you know, you know, the one I return to most, which is Dickinson, and I still return to her. There's something about the transparency of her language that is really remarkable, and it doesn't change. Now, look, I've been reading her. I didn't read her when I was younger. I couldn't. It was just like I, it didn't make any sense to me. It was opaque at that point, right? And then at some point, I tried in the early 90s or late 80s, I tried reading a couple of poems and I found there was an opening for me because that sometimes happened. From blindness, you become able to see with certain artists or writers, right? So it took me a while to get there. But once I got there, I didn't want to put the book down. I, I read everything that was published uh, at that time, which was like the Franklin collection of, I don't know, 1,700 poems, you know. And uh, it was really a transformative experience and there too you have that mirror thing going on like you do with Iceland because I'm seeing a lot in her that I think is really myself I'm like the narcissist but she was just more nature like I think when art really is successful it's it's nature you can't uh, it adds to the totality of the necessary things to keep a balance in the world so she struck me that way how conscious were you of her original manuscripts when you first started reading her? Because there is such a visual power to those original manuscripts, isn't there? And the punctuation's particularly unique and all that sort the of... The calligraphy. That, that that you're, talking, a... you're talking about the actual handwritten fascicles. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I knew about them. And in fact, there's a really beautiful publication, which just is... It just basically is printed all of them. But then it also have partial pages glued into the spine where she actually, you know, she would um, sew together the variations. And so this, this um, manu, it's this uh, facsimile, it's sort of a facsimile, uh, did that, you know, it's, it's for also, all, Harvard publishes all of this stuff, but a really nice publication. And that really just got me how visual that was, her, her work and her phys the physicality of binding these works together, I found quite fascinating. I think the most striking thing was the, the fact that she didn't play to an audience, you know, that she was working in the space of her own dialogue, critical dialogue, really, with herself and whatever was around her and that. And she, obviously she's, she had the strength or the faith, because I think it is a lot about suspending judgment and believing in something that you could facilitate as an artist. She uh, was quite unique that way. And so much of her poetry really comes out of her, her letters. You know, uh, you'll find a great portion of her writing that wound up almost, almost verbatim in a poem, in a letter. In Island Zombie, you talk about how in Iceland you reread some of those letters and it's sort of you connected this landscape that you were in, which, of course, uh, Emily Dickinson didn't know anything like that. She was just in Amherst in Massachusetts yeah. all her life, whereas yeah. there are you in this extraordinary wild landscape mm. reading Dickinson. So yeah. it, the contrast of those two things is really powerful. And yet you connect the experience that Emily has in her, in her imagination with the very physical experience you're having in Iceland. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I think that Vesuvius at home, that expression that she wrote, I think at first in a letter, I just, I love that. I love that she thought of herself as Vesuvius at home. 
<laughs> Tell me about how you translated, you know, how you took on those poems and made physical objects from them. I guess I'm interested in how do you, se- one, how do you select the works that you, the poems that you draw from? But, but then also, what's the intention, I guess, behind taking words from Dickinson and making them into physical works? You know, I don't know if it's an intention, but the, the, the motivation was to create a view in a room, right? So if you have two butterflies went out at noon sitting in the corner, you go places. And that's the way I thought. So it was as simple as that. It was just about a view. Like, you know, you're looking out into a landscape. Well, this is, it has that potential complexity, but it's really going into yourself with it. So it's a different idea of view, but very much of a view. Um, as far as selecting, the, the key and cues were really the, the first body of work where I took just the first line. Emily Dickens is known for, for her first lines. I w- w- spent the afternoons reading her our index of first lines, right? Which is early on. That's how they uh, cataloged her work because it wasn't uh, she didn't use titles or anything. So somebody numbered them, which was not her. But anyway, the index of first li- uh, lines became the the kind of way to enter the work. And for me, they they became a kind of, I say, a cue, almost like a direction, a, uh, a, a necessary tool in, in itself. I'm thinking, you know, I felt my life with both my hands. I think, I don't know what that means, but I think that's right. You know, you um, th- this way she had of paying attention to things that are, are going on all the time, I mean, the two butterflies is a good example, but there are a lot of examples where she's uh, stating facts that nobody ever pays attention to, you know, things like this. So uh, what I did was I called out from the first lines, uh, the, those first lines that were basically statements, you know, because many of the first lines are only half a lot. It's really only half lines, it's really two lines. The, the other thing that... And I don't know why I did this. It was just my, my personal instinct was I excluded references to religion. You know, she would refer to God or the master or him. And I just, I didn't want to go there because there was so much secular stuff in her work that was so rich. And I didn't, I guess partly because I didn't share that option, even though the poem that such a line might be situated might be exquisite. But for just a one-line thing, I was looking for a kind of something that was self-contained and whole. That's the thing. They are often quite whole, her, her first lines. like um... well, There's that great one, the, to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. It's beautiful. I love that. It's like, and that, okay, the rest of the poem is great too, but that's enough. Yeah, yeah, or uh, dust is the only secret. It's like, well, what more can you say? I mean, that's accurate. <laughs> There's that work that you made, um, which is called How Dickinson Stayed Home. Yes. And and in that, you take the individual letters of a line from her work, which is my business is circumference. Yeah. And I wonder to, to what extent did you also view that as a kind of manifesto for your own thinking, your own work? Definitely. I mean, it's uh, I, I love the idea that by installing this as a, as a full, full room installation that you would walk among this and get that experience and that information, uh, you, you would have an actual experience in time, in your life, that is, is a metaphor for where that came from. And of course, obviously, you know, we've talked a lot about Emily Dickinson and she continues, you know, there were at least four series that I know of works that relate to her but then there are also other writers who have been consistently important to you and you see it a lot in island zombie for instance flannery o'connor who um appears again in quotes um but i'm interested there for instance there's a there's a work one of the glass pieces a, a beautiful yellow glass piece i think it is it's called the peacock likes to sit on gates and fence posts yeah 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 that one <laughs> You know, it's kind of arbitrary. I just take quotes I've collected over the years and I just stick it on 
Um, there's no connection. It's just that I learned from Richard Serra early on uh, about titles and how they can be so intimate and influential and have nothing to do with the work. It's fine. You know what I mean? It takes nothing to read it. And you have maybe you had a good experience with it, right? So that's the way I've titled my work over the years. As a, as a it's a bit about uh, sharing something beautiful and having no, you know, a quotation is a hard thing to to share because there's the context will uh, brush off on it and change it, you know. So a title is if you can accept that it's not really related to the work; it's just about uh, itself. That's a, that's a perfect place to put it. But then at the same time, there's another um, title, which I think very much relates to what I'm reading in Island Zombie, which is that, for, so um, another Flannery O'Connor quote, which is his mother's eyes intimate but untouchable with a blue of great distances after sunset. And there's so much of that in your Iceland experience, right? Again, that body and landscape connection. Well, there's a whole series of sculptures because I found that when I was reading or rereading Flannery in Iceland, I found that all of her short stories, or many of them, have she would introduce a character through their eyes. You know, really, really beautiful, in some cases, really beautiful lines. Like, there's a very beautiful one about uh, being blind, but the type, kind of blindness where the blind person doesn't know they're blind, that kind of blindness. <laughs> You know, and I'm not getting it right, but the, she just had these exquisite kind of capsule portraits that could, you know, uh, be uh, relevant to so many people. So, yeah, I I found also one of my favorite authors to read in in Iceland, particularly when I was working on on a piece called Pie, and I was working on it all the way up in the north, which is right adjacent to the Arctic Circle, which is a big nothing if you ask me, but wow, what an idea, was uh, uh, Thomas Bernhardt. And I really took a deep dive because I was up there for a few weeks and, uh, you know, that was, you know, and I'm a big fan of, of his work, pretty much all of it. And I even read his autobiography, Gathering Evidence, I think it was called, where I discovered he was tubercular. And he was treated, you know, so they chopped out parts of his lung. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, now I understand where he, you know, where he comes from. You know, this, it really uh, it made a difference in my, my reading of his work. So, and, you know, there were a number of authors that I took on that way because it was such a pleasure, Nabokov, to have, be in Iceland, and to have this at night, you just read, you know, or whatever. When I was doing the Library of Water, it was Cormac McCarthy. I wasn't expecting to like, but I wound up liking him quite a lot. Let's talk about Library of Water now that you've mentioned it, because one of the things that occurs to me is that its meaning is shifting rather like the water that you've rightly said is so in, in constant flow and mutability. Mm. So when you made it, it seemed urgent because glaciers were literally disappearing and that urgency has grown again. So can you say something about that? Did you, When you made it, did, were you conscious that this was a, a work that would become increasingly urgent, if you like. It was, a, it was about loss and memory. Oh, I knew, I knew that. I, 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 I'll, I'll try to give you exactly where I was coming from. Uh, when I decided on the idea of a library of water, uh, one of the issues that came up, well, exactly what are the terms for including a specimen of water or whatever? You know, Iceland is, it's nothing if it's not water. It's, its you know, it's like the human body. It's 99% water. So you've got the, the fresh water. You've got the glacial water and glaciers separate. And then you've got hot water, you know, which is pretty impressive stuff too. So the, the water I settled on, which was the glacier where I would take the ice from the glacier, I would take a, like a brick of ice with all of its impurities from tens of thousands of years ago, right? Old water. I did it because glacial water was the most finite source of water in Iceland. It was almost arbitrary in a sense. Rather than having to pick this river over that river, which I couldn't, how the fuck am I going to do that? It was real easy for me to take 20, there were a lot more than 24 glaciers in, in Iceland, but there were the major glaciers. You know, then you have a lot of um, sub-glaciers, small tongues, but the major glaciers. 
So that, that was kind of the parameter that made it easy for me to do. It was very difficult to actually collect the water because these glaciers are all in places where there are no roads and stuff. And of course I knew that it would be taken as an environmental statement and I and, and I'm, was perfectly happy with that. Um, for me, um, and now you know that there are three glaciers, I think now, that are gone. The water's there, but but the glaciers aren't. And it's pretty poignant. It's, it's very poignant to be there without the glacier now when I go to visit that work. You know, there was an article recently in a newspaper where they were quoting somebody in Iceland that decided, what was it, an obituary for a glacier. There's a glacier called Ok, O-K, spelled O-K. So this was a small glacier gone. And I think the president was saying, this is terrible, we don't have the glacier anymore, we should at least get the water. And I thought, you got the water, girl! Let's talk about music. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? You know, I used to listen to music all the time. Lately, less so. But I, uh, Missy Elliott is a is a big one for me. I, I love her her whole shtick. But then, you know, I I have to say Kanye West was fucking good when he was good. You know, <laughs> uh, and I still listen uh, to his work. Oh God, it would be endless. Billie Holiday. Uh, I loved Betty Carter. I love jazz vocals. I was going to ask you about that, actually. I was going to ask you about... There's a work that I saw in London. It was a drawing called Or Seven. And it's one of those cut-up drawings with these sort of spiralled shapes. Mm. And in, in amongst them, you see the names of jazz singers. Well, singers, actually. Jesse Norman, but also there's Billie Holiday. Ella is repeated, and I presume that's Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah. And then... And also Shirley Horn, which I thought it must have, you, oh, I love Shirley you might have enjoyed Horn, writing yeah. because, yeah. But, you know, no relation, but, but, you know. So can you tell me about that? I mean, is that, when you were, when you were putting those names in there, was that anything to do with the fact that you were listening to them or was it more just about recalling them in some other way? Jesse Norman passed away recently and I was working on a drawing at the time. So I wanted to, to fold her into that work. And and then of course I there were all these other uh, brilliant singers. Uh, that's been a part of my life since I was a kid because you know I remember I'd come home and I had a transistor radio, <laughs> and I'd lay on the lay on my bed with it sitting on my stomach and it would be the WKCR Columbia Broadcasting from Colum- Columbia University. They had this amazing jazz program and often it was 24s they, they they would do these marathons where they would play everything charles mingus ever recorded or everything eric dolphy ever recorded and it was just i mean i i that that was very important to me because jazz that idea of improvisation is where a lot of the drawing comes from i think and a lot of the way i work comes from that kind of engaging in the now to get to the future. You were talking about sculpture earlier on, about do you define what you do as sculpture or whatever? But what I noticed that, that, that you did say at one time that you feel like drawing is, a, is closer to being the thing that unites all of your work. Yes, that's right, uh, Ben. I, I, drawing as an act is probably the thing that occurs in everything I do, including the writing. I, I, I see drawing... If, if, you, if you consider the 22 definitions of drawing, I'm talking about all of them, you know? So, because drawing is, is uh, in its essence, a dialectic activity. You know, uh, translation, metamorphosis, uh, to draw out, uh, to focus, all of these things that, uh, yeah, definitely, when I think of drawing, that's what I'm thinking of. Like when these pigment drawings that I do, that's just, okay, that's one part of the spectrum. Yeah. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that's a kind of essential ritual for you? Sadly, there isn't. 
You know, like I look at some of my friends who swim every day and admire that, but I come from a very uh, non-physical culture. No vacations and uh, no physical activities. <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, I, I think about, well, what, what is it that I do? I do, it is something about finding the focus but it's much more of an instinctive thing. It's not even ritual. It's sometimes it's just as simple as I start putzing. I spend a lot of time in the studio because a lot of the time is not productive. <laughs> it's just the way life is. So I, I putz. And the putzing, like whether it's like I'm, I'm working on a project which is a log. I think it, I finally came down to calling it a log because what I did was I committed to doing something every day and it would eventually become one thing. It, it, so I found myself be moving things around, looking at things you did, you know, getting entering into that critical space where you could see something is what it is. It's not, it's not really a ritual, though. <laughs> I don't do anything habitually. I like the idea that I, every day is an invention of me. You know, it's not a by, by rote. There's nothing regular, not even food, unfortunately. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? That's such an obnoxious question, Ben. But <laughs> I would say any cloud or water study by da Vinci. I love that exploration, which is uh, also uh, almost engineering. You know, it's just like discovery. Uh, I still look at those drawings and I, I can never get enough of them. Okay, last question. What's art for? That question begs the question of, are you talking about for the artist or for the audience or for the non-artist, let's say? What is it for? I think, I'm not sure that it would be the same thing. I'm not really sure. I thought for myself, uh, it's everything from provocation, education, enlightenment, survival, uh, entertainment, pleasure, you know, it, it I've never thought that I would be good at anything else but this, because I have a lot of space in my head that, you know, you can put me alone in a room for the next year, I venture, and I wouldn't have a problem with it, because I'm always, I'm self-entertaining, you know, or self-engaging. And um, art is a, is a wonderful answer for me in terms of, uh, leaving evidence of myself, you know, or being a witness. Uh, a lot about being an artist for me is, is being a witness, um, particularly with a piece like this log, which is profoundly autobiographical, but not in a descriptive way, not, it, you just see what my proclivities are. Ronnie. Thank you so much for talking to me on the podcast. Yeah, what a pleasure, Ben. You're really a pleasure. Thank you. Island Zombie, Iceland Writings by Ronnie Horn is published by Princeton University Press and priced £30 or $35. Ronnie Horn's You Are the Weather is on view at the Fondation Baila in Rien near Basel in Switzerland until the 17th of January 2021. An exhibition of Ronnie's recent work is at House and Worth in New York from the 18th of February until the 10th of April. And an exhibition taking the title You Are the Weather is part of the opening programme of the Kunsthaus Göttingen in Germany, opening at some point in the spring. The work Pi is going to be included in an exhibition curated by a previous guest on a brush with, Ragnar Kjartensen, at the VAC Foundation in Moscow, opening in September 2021. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Julia Mahalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentel, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir Jalla. Huge thanks to Ronnie Hall. Join us on Friday for the Week in Art and on Wednesday for the next episode of this podcast, which I'm delighted to tell you is a brush with Rachel Whiteread. Bye for now. 
This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.